Halo, the franchise best known for one thing, blowing up aliens. Whether they're elder tor parasites that will consume all life in the galaxy with their unending hunger, or they're funny little awkward and sometimes suicidal creatures that make birthday noises when you shoot them in the head, we just like to murder aliens. <laughs> Yay, indeed. It's one of the biggest reasons that we love Halo. Hell, it's the reason that I love Halo and keep coming back to it iteration, after 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 iteration. No matter how much it hurts me. <sighs> Halo 5, I will forgive you, but I will not forget. Yet, while Halo is all about the explosions and the murdering, there is one game that doesn't completely fit in. One game that's not like the others. I'm talking, of course, about Halo 3 ODST. Or as I like to call it, Halo 3 Oodst. Let it play on your tongue a little bit. Oodst. 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 Oodst is the cheese balls. You see, Halo 3 ODST is the game that should not be. Not only is ODST a complete tonal shift for the franchise, focusing on a more somber, small stake story, it was also created out of the ashes of a completely different Halo project and was made in basically a single year. This game should be a complete and utter mess. And yet, it's absolutely beautiful. In fact, for my money, Halo 3 ODST is far and away the best campaign in the entire Halo series. Oh yeah, I said it, better than Halo 2 with its annoying cliffhanger, or Halo Reach with its pretentious nihilism, or Halo 5 with its, well, everything. Just, just everything. That game was more confused than my gender. Hide and seek's over, Infinity. This game is mwah. I love you, Oost. Never change. So, before all of us get wrapped up in that new car smell of Halo Infinite, I want to explain why this red-headed stepchild of the franchise, whose other entries have sold millions of copies and revolutionized gaming, is actually the Halo that matters most. After the success of a little game called Halo 3, in 2007, developer Bungie was able to buy itself out from parent company Microsoft. Yet despite being newly independent and bright-eyed like a college student taking a gap year, as part of the deal, Microsoft would continue to own the rights to Halo, and Bungie agreed to continue making exclusive Halo projects for the time being. One such project was Halo Chronicles, a game made alongside Peter Jackson's much-hyped Halo movie with Mr. Lord of the Rings himself overseeing production. But because we can't have nice things, things, Halo Chronicles, which was reported to be an episodic interactive movie a la the later Xbox exclusive Quantum Break, was eventually cancelled along with the franchise's feature film debut. Uh, at the very least, Peter Jackson went on to make great works of cinema right after that with the Hobbit movies. Huh. But with the Halo Chronicles development team now sitting around twiddling their thumbs and work on the forthcoming Halo Reach just beginning, Bungie realized it had just enough time to create what producer Curtis Cremere described as a mini campaign, but they only had about one year to make it. To which the development team presumably said, challenge accepted. You know, when you're already wearing glasses, putting on sunglasses doesn't have that same amount of dramatic effect, does it? Anyways, with a blank check to do whatever they wanted, lead writer Joseph Staten and design director Paul Bertone Jr. decided to try and do something new with the Halo franchise. Right when you start Halo ODST, instead of the series' typical operatic opening number, the first thing you're greeted to is a haunting, wailing saxophone signaling that this isn't your granddaddy Master Chief's Halo. Like the music, Halo ODST wasn't going to be your bombastic space opera, but instead took its cues from an entirely different genre. Film Noir, a cinematic style defined by its distinct visual aesthetic, darkened city street setting, and brooding tone. Yet, like any good Film Noir story, ODST needed a good mystery at its heart. 
ODST starts you off as an orbital drop shock trooper, one of the iconic human troopers that were first introduced in Halo 2. Specifically, you play as the Rookie, a silent protagonist, who joins up with our new ODST squad. Sadly, on the same day as the events of Halo 2. Some troopers never get any luck. The Rookie squad drops into the Earth City New Mombasa to help fight back the Covenant invasion, just as the Jumping Covenant carrier destroys half the city, knocking the Rookie's pod off course and separating them from their squad. Waking up hours later in the abandoned nighttime streets, the Rookie is tasked with uncovering what happened to their squad as they try to avoid the roving Covenant patrols. And it's these eerie streets where that noirish atmosphere is most palpable, with that haunting piano and saxophone accompanying you through the dark city. No other Halo game has had this sense of character and personality so baked into its very soul. Yet what sells the subtle dread most is the game's choice of the ODST as the player's avatar. Until now, every Halo game had you play as the Master Chief, a scientifically modified super soldier whose armor is literally named after a Norse god's weapon. You felt invulnerable because you basically were. You know how expensive this gear is, son? Tell that to the Covenant. But this game, importantly, tosses all that away. Alas, poor Master Chief. I knew him well, Cortana. ODSTs are just normal humans, and sadly, normal humans can't take on an entire Covenant army by themselves, forcing you to quietly and stealthily stalk the streets of New Mombasa. To represent this, the game brought back the health bar, forcing you to scavenge for health packs dotted around the city. A surprising move considering that the original Halo had been the one to help popularize regenerative health in the first place. Okay, bring us energy shields online, please. If the Master Chief is a power fantasy with a one-note personality that players could imagine themselves into, the completely silent rookie, conversely, is a blank slate with zero personality that actually puts players into the game, making you feel even smaller amidst the towering skyscrapers. For a franchise known for throwing you into the fray with Bombast, the quiet world of ODST instantly subverts expectations and highlights the perspective. Even further, New Mombasa allowed Bungie to experiment with another game design choice that they would later utilize in their future games like Destiny, an open world. While it wasn't a completely open sandbox, progress through New Mombasa was less linear than prior games, and most first-person shooters of the era. Do you blaze through a Covenant patrol, hide by going through nearby buildings, attempt to circumvent them altogether by taking another route, or, like me, do you get lost and end up wandering in circles for 20 minutes? That's, uh... That's not the game's fault, I, I, I do that in real life too. Yet this type of middle ground approach between linear and open gameplay, I truly love, and I think it still feels fresh today, with companies like Dishonored and Deathloop creator Arcane still experimenting with this all roads lead to Rome type of level design. The multiple but limited amount of approaches allows for a curated and well-designed experience that still lets the player have agency in how they tackle a given situation. Yet despite all these changes that I've already mentioned and their short timetable in making this game, Bungie still managed to find even more ways to experiment with ODST, adding weapons like the Silenced SMG, a satisfyingly stealth-focused cousin to the iconic battle rifle. They also added in the visor, which highlighted enemies in your HUD for an even further visual flair. There is even a new Covenant enemy type, the Engineer, which floated around giving shields to nearby Covenant and whose existence was integral to the game's story. Yet, if broody stealth exploration isn't your style, don't worry because ODST still delivers that typical Halo action goodness. Don't know why I became William Shatner there for a second, but there you go. Regardless, whenever the rookie finds a clue to his missing team's whereabouts, the game flashes back, putting you into the role of one of your squad mates earlier in the day. And in contrast to the rookie, each of these characters is filled with personality. Nathan Fillion as Buck plays his typical yet charming swashbuckling leader type. Because the only thing I regret about you and me not knowing you were a spook when we first met. I would have been a lot less charming. Romeo, played by Adam Baldwin, plays the gruff weapons tech, and Alan Tudyk's Mickey was the irreverent engineer. Hurry up. 
But you want to do this? Be my guest. But this ain't a job you want to rush. Also, between the three of them, you get a nice little Firefly reunion, which, you know, is very appreciated. Sometimes they're scratched. Uh, I scratched your iPod with them. However, this does mean that we now need Summer Glau, Gina Torres, and Marina Baccarin in Halo, so get on that 3 for 3 We better get Jewel State in Halo Infinite or I riot. Honestly, we just need Jewel State in everything. I, I think we can all agree. The cast is also rounded out by the always amazing Nolan North as Dutch. Though, I do need to go a little Sojoa on you for a second, because it's worth mentioning that between ODST's release and today, there has been a larger cultural conversation about white actors voicing black characters, and how this can often sideline actors of color from finding work, and also can highlight stereotypes within the characters themselves and how they're represented within the work. And sadly, for my money, Nolan North as Dutch has aged badly in this respect. And this isn't me trying to say that this game is bad. I'm making a whole video about why I love this game. And it's also not me saying that Nolan North is bad or racist or offensive when he did this. But it's worth looking at these issues in older games, not to hate on them, but in order to create conversations about how the industry has and can continue to grow. I'm not here to dictate the morality of this casting, but I'm here to ask you to think about it and its effects. The point is to create discussions, not dead ends in conversations. And speaking of which, we also have Battlestar Galactica's underappreciated Trisha Helfer as Dare, a military intelligence officer with a romantic history with Buck. And Buck? Call me Captain. I'll pass on that dance, but you can't show me where to sit. Dare is dead set focused on her own mission in New Mombasa, and at the start of the game, assumes command of the ODST squad, but ultimately ends up going out on her own once Buck's squad gets separated in the botched landing. And Dare, despite being named after a really terrible middle school anti-drug program, is a cool character, mostly on the back of Helfer's fantastic performance. Yet, she sadly doesn't break the mold of the aloof, emotionless women characters that have littered Halo from the very first game. Say what you will about Halo 4 and 5, they did at least give Cortana and Dr. Halsey more character moments than all the other women in this franchise combined. Come on, Chief. Take a girl for a ride. And that is the only good thing I will say about Halo 5. Okay, that one level where you ran down the side of that robot was kind of a little bit cool. However, on the whole, in their short time on screen, the characters in ODST have more personality than almost every character in all the other Halo games. Sans Sergeant Johnson. That man has more personality in his pinky than I will ever have in my entire lifetime. So smile, would ya? Well, we still got something to smile about. Beyond the characters though, the flashback levels bring that classic blockbuster feel of a typical Halo game. Yet instead of the repetitive shoot enemies reload and repeat cycle, Bungie took full advantage of the shorter game to make each level feel different by building them around a unique set piece. One level places you on the edge of a towering skyscraper fighting off banshees, while another sees you tearing up a zoo in a warthog like admittedly we all wanted to do, while another sees you barely holding off Covenant waves as you blow up a data center, and even another has you hijacking a Covenant carrier. Every single level in this game has huge cinematic beats that bring that sense of scale and awe to the proceedings that one expects from a Halo game. Yet despite this though, the story still feels surprisingly and refreshingly small. The ODSTs aren't saving the galaxy like Master Chief, but just trying to evacuate civilians, minimize damage, and get back home from a battle that's already been lost. You even see the horrors as the Covenant glass the city, the same exact horrific fate we would see befall the planet Reach in the next game. And honestly, I really love the smaller scale. Today, and even when ODST was released, we constantly have games and even movies focus on the end of the world or the galaxy, and honestly, it gets a bit tiring. Having varying levels of stakes in games allows us to invest more in the stories being told. Sure, don't get me wrong, I like to save the galaxy every now and then, but if you're doing it like every other Tuesday, well, does it even feel worthwhile? Do we, do we even need a galaxy? Why, why can't the galaxy just save itself for once? Why is it always good to be me? Huh? Huh? Yet, one of the coolest aspects of the flashback levels is how they overlap with the rookie's journey, having you traverse the same locations in both timelines. Not only do you see how much the city has changed in just a few short hours, the bombastic flashbacks are filled with explosions, life, and multiple other marines, making a return to the rookie's lonely and quiet nighttime escapades even more isolating. However, you're not completely alone. 
Adding to the creepy factor, you'll start to notice messages and hints directed at you by the city itself, caused by the city superintendent, an AI. Even further, if you begin to look around you, you'll find malfunctioning registers spewing out money, or phones ringing. Wait, they, they still have phone booths in the 26th century? I guess in the Halo universe, they found out that smartphones are actually terrible for us. Huh. Is it sad that I want to live in this alien invasion-filled future rather than the smartphone algorithm-led dystopia that we have now? Is that too real? Regardless though, if you interact with these ringing slices of nostalgia, you'll discover one of ODST's best additions. Sadie's Story. Sadie's Story is a fully dramatized audiolog narrative that tells the story of, well, uh, S Sadie. Sadie is a young girl trying to survive the Covenant's invasion in a story that reflects Inferno, the tale of Dante's journey into hell written by the poet Virgil. That's so pretentious it'll even make your high school English teacher say, hmm, yeah. Each person Sadie meets on her journey represents another level of hell, like lust or greed, as she's helped by the AI created by her father, Virgil. Get it? The AI's name is Virgil because Virgil wrote Inferno? It's smart, goddamn! Sadie's journey also mirrors the rookie's own journey out of their own Inferno, because as you make your way through the city and start to find more clues about your team members, you'll begin to notice that the sun is starting to rise. Even the music starts to evoke a more hopeful tone as the dawn approaches, as the piano and saxophone slowly stop dominating the score. Eventually, you, as the rookie, meets up with Dare, who reveals that she's been trying to find a rogue Covenant engineer. Who, by the way, is absolutely adorable. I mean, look at this little pink and blue blob, I love them so much, they're so freaking cute! Turns out, though, that this engineer has been controlling the superintendent the whole time in order to help you, and wants to defect to the human side because their whole species has been enslaved. So, uh, yeah, that means that any time you killed an engineer in this game, you were killing an innocent life, so... Have that weighing on your soul. You haven't killed any of them, have you? No! Well, maybe one or two. Nice work. Hooray for casual war crimes! Thankfully, though, you and this adorable little thing who apparently is a big fan of trucks, yes, he is! Yes, he is! Meet up with Buck and the rest of your crew for one final climactic battle across the New Mombasa Highway as you're rescued just as the city is destroyed. It's an epic conclusion that doesn't undercut the horrors of the events in New Mombasa or the small stakes of the game, yet still feels grand and important at the same time, leaving ODST to finish off on a high note. What can I say? It was a hell of a night. ODST, for me, is a powerful experience. It's one of those unique games where all the elements interweave together, marrying gameplay with the intentions of the story. The best games shouldn't just be cinematic experiences with gameplay in between, but actually use the gameplay to make you feel what the game wants you to come away with, and I think ODST does this. The vulnerability of your character is mirrored by your health bar and stealth gameplay. The juxtaposition of the bombastic flashbacks and the lonely new Mombasa streets highlight each character's isolation. ODST makes you feel both the horrors of the Covenant as you watch this beautiful city slowly being emptied, then destroyed, while also making you understand it intimately as you comb over it over and over and over again. And it's for all these reasons that it still stands out amongst a huge franchise all these years later, despite some aged elements. Even more so, it's what makes it surprisingly more resonant now than it was when it was released. When I set out to write this video, I only wanted to pay homage to a game that I really, really loved and felt was often overlooked for its bigger siblings. Yet, replaying ODST in late 2021, it made me feel something deeper and, and feel a deeper resonance with the game. ODST is the story of a lone protagonist, isolated, desperately trying to reconnect with those who, just moments before, 
were right by their side. It's a game where you wander a city that only a short while ago was filled with life, but is now haunted by tragedy, death, and pain that left no one untouched, and you can still see the scars of it. And still, despite our best efforts, will never be the same again, even if it is saved. What scrap of it can be saved? These past two years have been incredibly isolating. If you're anything like me during this pandemic that has defined 2020 and 2021, you probably felt like the rookie, a passive observer to horrors that you can't control, despite just all you're trying to do is reconnect with those who mean so much to you. We may not be battling aliens, but I'm sure you resonate with that fact of not being sure if you'll reach that new dawn at the end. Wandering the darkness of a city, wandering the streets of New Mombasa, felt personal in a way that never did before when I first played this game. So for the game to slowly build off of memories of connection, eventually building to a triumphant conclusion that may be tempered with sadness, trauma, pain, but still having hope in the face of all those desperate circumstances. To still emerge from the isolating depths of that inferno, that journey through that inferno, to still find hope and still find those you care for, feels more resonant than it did in 2009. Few games, especially a game made in less than a year, end up being a true standout in one of the world's biggest franchises. This game was a risk, it was dangerous, it could have been a horrible misstep for the series. All of that was certainly possible, yet it's because, yet it's because of that risk, that possible danger, the fact that it tried something new, is why ODST suddenly feels more resonant today, even years after it's been mostly forgotten. Games like ODST are exactly what this industry needs more of, even decades later. Games that are willing to take chances, even, no, especially within franchises that grow more stagnant with each installment, more ingrained in what they're supposed to be. It's games like ODST that stand the test of time because they say something meaningful, not just with big explosions, but in the quiet moments, and say something different that stands out from the rest of the franchise. It's only then that they might have a chance to continue to be meaningful years after other games have been forgotten to time.